couple of years ago, I was named Interministerial Commissary for Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Planning uh, in Belgium by the government um, as an apolitical person. And for them, that's very handy because when everything goes well, they can take the credit, and when things go bad, then they have somebody to, uh, to knock on the head. So an apolitical person to, uh, to lead such an endeavor is very attractive for them. This is way too long. Uh, if you have to say that every day you go crazy so quickly, that was named by the media as the flu commissary, and that's something that, uh, well, that I live with. Uh, although in times when there is no pandemic, it doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, what that means, basically a big part of that job is, is talking to different people, talking to different groups, uh, to different um, people basically. Um, and if you have to talk to large groups, that means that you have to talk to the media. If you want to, in a very swift and easy way, reach a lot of people, then the media is, uh, is quite an important way on how to do this. It's very important when faced with a pandemic to be able to do a lot of things on day one. The most important day of a crisis, uh, and that's very well known in crisis management, is, is day one. Day one is the day that you can set the tone uh, and that you have to definitely speak with one voice and one message, which means that that first day you have to be omnipresent. You have to be everywhere, uh, and then you suck the cameras with you and you have to visibly suffer. Be everywhere. Uh, and in that way you can control that one message, <coughs> which means that you make a good start and the first headlines will be, our country is ready for a pandemic, we're well prepared, everything is under control, and that's much better than all the, uh, all the alternatives. That means that you should not shy away from live interviews. Live interviews is something which many scientists absolutely don't like, but it is the only time that you can say whatever and have complete control about what you say. Everything you say will be broadcasted, and that's, that's really a, uh, a strength. Uh, terminology is quite important. What's in a name? Well, the thing that we've, we dealt with five years ago was the, well, swine flu, the pandemic H1N1 slash 09 virus, the novel influenza A H1N1, the 2009 A H1N1, the North American influenza at a certain time, or the novel flu virus. That just doesn't work. In Belgium, we just call it Mexican flu. Uh, just like people will call it Spanish flu, Hong Kong flu. Of course, that was not politically correct. Yeah? And people, of course, made fun of it. And I got nasty emails and letters from the, the Mexican embassy, uh, as was expected. Uh, but it had the clear advantage that everybody from day one would know what we meant when we said Mexican flu. And that had a lot of advantages uh, over all the, the other politically correct terminology. So Mexican flu and, and even flu commissary were on the top 10 list of word of the year, new words that would be taken up in the dictionary for 2009. Uh, the first one was defriending on Facebook. So we lost out there with Mexican flu to Facebook, but hey, that's okay. These first weeks, the first days in a pandemic or in a crisis, that's where the media needs you. That means that you can really get a lot of information uh, or give them a lot of information and it goes to the public. These are the, the weeks that you can educate the public. You have the floor and you can basically say whatever you want and you can explain them what is a pandemic, H1N1 is a virus, uh, and you have to show nice pictures. That is very important when you talk to the media. <laughs> they have to love your pictures. When they love your pictures, then they are with you. So you can explain a lot about the transmission of H1N1, transmission of viruses, and they go along, they go along with your message as long as you can, uh, as long as you can entertain them. Yeah. A very important technique when dealing with the media, and especially when you have to keep something out of the media or downplay it a little bit, is to divide the message over two, peer, two points in time. Divide it over two days. And for you look at page four. If you can get something on page four instead of page one, you win there. One of the things that we were very worried about, and rightly so, was when WHO was going from one phase to another. It really meant geographic spread, but that was misunderstood by everybody, basically, and people thought that it was sort of an, an earthquake scale, yeah? uh, where uh, three or four on the Richter scale would be less than five and six on the Richter scale. This was not a Richter scale. 
So when we knew from the people, the Belgian people that, uh, that are living uh, in WHO circles, that WHO was ready to go to another phase, then we could already the day before say it in the media that WHO is going from phase four to phase five. And that gets on page four. It gets on page four because it didn't happen yet. Yeah? So when it finally happens, uh, then it also gets on page four because they already talked about it the last day. So if you can split a message up uh, over two days, then, uh, then you can avoid headlines when it's not necessary. It's very important to have a measured response. One of the things that we didn't do, well, we in Belgium we had um, a lot of uh, books on how to handle pandemics. I mean, there were uh, scenarios that were ready on how to tackle uh, uh, an influenza pandemic. However, and that was true in most countries, most of these, uh, most of these um, scenarios were made for a flu that would be much, much worse. So from day one, we said, forget about the scenarios, we'll improvise. Yeah, which is horror for the politicians, because politicians, they like scenarios because they're predictable. Yeah, politicians like predictability. So if then you suddenly go and improvise and titrate, because you're not improvising, you're titrating your message to the severity of the crisis at hand, that was very important. So if you can stay calm, cool, and collected, and say from the first moment, and that was really our mantra, at this moment, this flu that we see here at that time in Mexico, a little later in the US, is comparable in terms of personal severity to seasonal influenza, but we'll do a lot of things in preparation for something that might be worse. That's a message that you can get, uh, you can get across. In Belgium, we focused a lot on low-cost basic hygiene measures, washing hands. It's terribly unsexy. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. But you can, you, at least people have the feeling that they can do something. And, uh, and it, contribute, uh, it can contribute to, um, to mitigating the, uh, the epidemic. We didn't do crazy things like in France, like school closures. Because it's very stupid when you do something and you close schools or you take any other measure, you have to be able to know, how can I get rid of that measure? What's my exit strategy? And that's very difficult with closing schools. Yeah, you can close a school. I mean, Sarkozy did that in France. You close a school when that many classes in a school are affected. You close a class when that many people or, or pupils in a class are, uh, are sick. And then you close the school. And at a certain point in time, you have to reopen the school. So it's closed, and then a couple of days later, you reopen the school, and a couple of days later, you close the school again, and then you open the school again. And when you do that two times, everybody is sick and tired of you, and I would say rightfully so. So if it's not necessary, by the severity of the epidemic, that's something that you don't contemplate doing. In Belgium, unlike in the UK, we did not use a lot of antivirals. We used it in the beginning to mitigate the spread as much as we could, but we were not giving them out as candy as some of the countries did, because that was in their scenarios. It was in the scenarios, if there is a pandemic, boom, you can get antivirals everywhere. That's something that we did not do. Um, we also only bought one dose of vaccine per person, in contrast to some countries who purchased two doses of vaccine per person. Uh, and if our mantra was, at this moment, this uh, is comparable to a seasonal influenza, then, well, when we had the vaccination campaigns, we more or less used the same high-risk groups as for seasonal influenza. So we didn't overdo it. Uh, and you know you're doing okay when you have cartoons like this in the media that sort of laugh with the under-exaggerated response. So this says Mexican flu. Flu commissary Marek van Rans is not worried, and then uh, in, the, in the balloon there, and I would like to stress that there is no reason for panic. Everybody should stay calm. We have everything under control. When, when people laugh with you, that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, then you're doing okay. We didn't have a media budget, but that's okay. Um, these, these very expensive media campaigns where the government pays for airtime or pays for big advertorials in the newspaper, nobody reads them. People hate it watching that. So you have to make the media work for you. You can do that when you already had a good relationship with the media. When journalists call and you pick up your phone, well, after a couple of years, you can sort of call in your favors. 
uh, and they will do you a favor. And they basically, they, the journalists in Belgium, they made advertorials basically for free, uh, and we had a lot of airtime there on the TV, on the radio. You, didn't, you don't need to buy that time. It's very expensive, prohibitively expensive, and you can do without that. It's very important in interviews to answer the questions of the day, not what the interviewer is asking you. Uh, of course, you have to answer that, but then you have to come to your talking points of the day. And these talking points you learn from your call center. Your call center is very important, not only to answer questions, but also to register what the questions of the day are. So we had a call center, and we monitored the call center activity very well, and every day we had sessions where we said, okay, what are the questions of the day? And there were a couple of phases there. In the beginning, the first questions, they were all travel-related. Can we still travel to Mexico? Can I get my money back for my travel to Mexico? So these were questions, and some of these questions you cannot predict. But after a couple of hours, you know these are the questions that everybody's asking. Well, then you should answer these questions in all the interviews and also on the social media. And that way, you quickly see that these questions are going away, and then others will, uh, others will invariably come up. It's very important to predict the future. If you don't want the first case in Belgium to be big news, then you have to predict that there will be a first case. It, at least it seems that you have the situation under control. So then it will be in a newspaper, well also Belgium will have H1N1 cases, and then when the first H1N1 case in your country appears, it's not that big of a deal because you predicted it. It's still a big deal, but it's less of a big deal than if it would uh, come as a, uh, as a surprise. And that was the the second big wave in call center activity was related to the first cases. I mean, am I at risk? Uh, a lot of questions come up then. Then you have to predict when you have cases that at a certain point in time that there will be fatalities. So also Belgium will have H1N1 deaths. And then a couple of days later, well, you have the first H1N1 death. And it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and that was the second wave, fairly closely after that, of, uh, of interest in the, uh, in the call center. I went to the first eight funerals of the people who died because, well, they're personal failures. If you have to protect the population from something and, well, people die, it's good to be there. People notice it, the press notices it, but you should never give interviews at funerals, of course. But at least, you know, that's, that's for sure. Well, it's very important not to do that. But they have to know that you care. And then you can get away with, uh, with, quite, uh, with quite a lot. And then comes vacation time. Vacation time for the media is a very weird period. Also, I took a couple of days of vacation. My father took a couple of pictures. And uh, it was not a good idea to go on vacation. You're constantly uh, on the phone with your team. Uh, at that time, he's now five years old. I had a, I had a very small baby, which was born uh, only two weeks before the, uh, the epidemic uh, started. So that was, not, that was not a good idea. And then the media gets distracted. Yeah. Everything has been said about the pandemic, and then, well, then people pick up on, on different things that they think are, are fine. The media, they love masks, and they're going to big, make big deal about things that are not very relevant. But during a vacation period, when that item becomes the vacation news, um, where they work with the secondary staff, with a lot of temporary people, with their best journalists on vacation. They have to restrict their attention to, uh, to small things, and then uh, things sort of get, uh, get out of hand. And then you become the story. So if, if everybody, everything is said about influenza, then they start about you, and everything starts out nice. Flu commissioner is a really great guy, and they make nice pictures of you. I look really small next to my giant sunflower. Uh, they are interested suddenly in, in your youth. This is me when I was 12 years old in my basement laboratory, and it, it's sort of a feel-good uh, feel story. And then it becomes more personal. <laughs> Yeah. Then they become extraordinarily interested in your, uh, in your personal life. And then, you be and then that's when they enter your house, and that's when my wife says, no, 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 don't do that too often. And, and then you become the story. But when that's a feel-good story, you can be very sure that at the same time, they're already sharpening the knife of the guillotine, because in Belgium and also in the Netherlands, that never works for more than a couple of weeks. And, and then they will find any disagreement uh, that, that people have and try to, uh, try to work it out. <laughs> so at a certain point in time, during the, uh, the late summer months and the beginning of the fall, uh, some of the general practitioners uni unions, uh, they, they wanted me fired. Why? 
Well, because I, well, that was during the negotiations with the GPs about how much money they could ask for a vaccination. And they wanted to ask a lot of money. And they said, well, we need to vaccinate a person. We need about 20 minutes to vaccinate a person. <laughs> I said, that's bullshit. Yeah? Let, let's, let's not do this. I, I know you know that that doesn't take 20 minutes. Yeah? You just want a lot of money for vaccinating people basically one every minute. And then they got really upset. They said, oh, and then they wanted me fired, which was not really a problem. That's when you call in another favor and you said, OK, I need a crew that follows me a whole day. Yeah. And then you do an interview in front of the parliament and you say, I'm way too busy to deal with the GP unions. Uh, they want me fired. I want to win the lottery. Both things are not going to happen. And you move to the order of the day. And that's not, uh, that's not a problem. <clears throat> and then the H1N1 vaccine arrived. And then the first messages were, the vaccine will arrive too late. The government doesn't do enough. We will not have enough vaccines. Get it while you can. And the vaccine becomes a, a precious commodity. Uh, but that quickly changes because then the anti-vaccination movement gets hold of the media and we moved in a situation where, well, the vaccine will be unsafe, it will kill you. Yeah? The anti-vaccination movement, they're, they're, they're getting pretty well organized. Uh, uh, and that was the, the, the latest part in the, and the, the most call center activity was actually focused on the, uh, on the vaccines. At the moment when the um, public was becoming worried about the safety of the vaccines and the vaccination campaign had just started day one, then came something which was very welcome to me. The professional football clubs of Anderlecht and Club Brugge, the top teams in Belgium, illegally obtained vaccines because they were not belonging to the risk groups and they would not be the first priority to be vaccinated, but they basically stole some vaccine uh, to have these very precious, high-paid uh, players to have them vaccinated. So I used that, and I over-exaggerated my response there. And this is Van Rans, this furious, was on the newspaper, because I said, this is not serious. You're stealing these vaccines from the pregnant women who need it. And I made a big scandal out of it. But that was fine, because that drew the attention from the vaccine is unsafe to this vaccine is so good that they will even vaccinate with illegally obtained stolen vaccines, these very healthy, high-priced players. And that changed the atmosphere uh, with, uh, in terms of vaccination. And that pandemic flu vaccination campaign, that went well without the trouble. So flu vaccination season, that's something when they come to, uh, to your office every year. Uh, and every year, it's quite important to defend that vaccination campaign. However, <laughs> however, with the, uh, the Cochrane reviews, with, with meta-analysis that were showing that these vaccines are maybe not working all that great, it becomes harder and harder to really push hard for vaccination and you get more backlash uh, from it than, than in the past. So it's very important to keep on message there uh, and say more truthfully uh, what, is on the, uh, what is on the agenda. They always want to take uh, pictures of people being vaccinated. Don't take kids. Yeah. Don't, don't take men. Yeah. You, have to, you have to take pictures of women. I mean, yeah, I'll show that again. These are kids. These are men. Yeah. These are, you, you cannot hurt women. Yeah. It has something to do with having more nerve endings in men in the, in the upper arm, I think. Then after the crisis, something important happens. Then after the crisis, everybody becomes smart. Uh, everybody is very good at predicting the past. Yeah? And then the government did too much, and people start writing articles, they start writing books about this, uh, and there even will be hearings for the uh, flu vaccination criminals, uh, and then the flu scam. We were all getting money from the pharmaceutical companies to promote these vaccines. Uh, and th this, uh, I actually, I keep mentioning this guy by name, is Wolfgang Wodark uh, from the Council of Europe, who had a motion supported by many of the European Parliament members that it was a fake pandemic, that actually the vaccination was a threat for health. This is when you do a Google Insights for Search, or Google Trends it is called now for H1N1. Yeah? You can see a lot of attention on H1N1 in 2009. This is when you Google Wolfgang Wodark. Yeah? It's very easy. It's very easy to give critique when you know that all ended well. Yeah? I would have been more impressed if he would have been vocal before or during the pandemic, but only afterwards, I think that's very easy and cheap. So this was a nice sabbatical in crisis management for me, 
but I'm pretty happy to be back in the lab and doing uh, my normal stuff. Thank you very much.